Hey everybody, we're back for another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. This time it's episode 85, and today we're tackling the subject of technique overload. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, but I'm better known as your host, Jeremy Lesniak. Now, Whistlekick, if you didn't already know, makes the world's best sparring gear and excellent apparel and accessories for practitioners and fans of the traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of you that are listening again. If you're not familiar with our products, you can learn more or buy over at whistlekick.com. All of our past podcast episodes, show notes, and a lot more are on a different site, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. From either site, you can sign up for our great newsletter, and you really should. We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. Now, today's subject actually comes in from an email sent in by a listener, and we have fair amount of dialogue going with a lot of our listeners, but this particular subject really seemed to jump out at me, and, and I thought this would be a great subject to break out into its own episode and share it with all of you. The email, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit of this, came in from a listener and it said, there are 108 combinations for a punch, and so how can one really be truly proficient with so much material? On the other hand, it is an art, and part of learning is just sometimes for fun, but at what expense to our students? And so that was part of a larger email, but you get the gist. That was the part that I really wanted to hone in on with today's episode. And it's a great question that this dilemma of how much stuff do we need to know? How much should we know? How much should we be teaching? And let me start by saying it's going to depend. It depends on the situation. It depends on the art. It depends on a lot of things. And we're going to get into some of those specific dependencies as we go through the episode. But the thing I want to get out of the way, these are my opinions. There is no right answer. I am not a lifelong instructor. Um, I am not even an active instructor with my own school. I do teach, of course, but I don't have the responsibility of bringing people from white belt up through the ranks. And so if you do, you're going to have a different perspective on this than I do most likely. I have had my own school, so we'll we'll see. We'll see. I'm I'm excited to see what the feedback is on this episode. So let's start with the subject of proficiency because that was really at the heart of the listener's question. And proficiency isn't something you achieve. You aren't just proficient at something at some point. There's no line in the sand. There's no measurement that we can say, oh, well, you've done this, so you are proficient. No, it's a completely subjective view of how you do things. And a lot of it is, yeah, you know it when you see it. But I think the fact that there is no objectively defined proficiency in something in the martial arts really does take center stage. And it's something that we need to explore. Techniques are going to get better with practice and with understanding. Absolutely. but the proficiency that someone might achieve with, let's say, a sidekick is going to be different depending on a lot of different things. We're going to explore those reasons, but just think about that for a moment. If I'm a seven-year-old kid, my proficiency with a sidekick, even if I put in a ton of time, even if I'm super talented, great body awareness, what we would call proficient for a seven-year-old at some kind of mid-level rank, it's not going to be the same as what we would expect to call a proficient sidekick of someone, let's say, in their 20s or 30s. Okay, It's different, and different is okay. Now, when we start thinking about the subject of volume of expectations, the number of movements, the number of forms, the number of defenses against, let's say, knife attacks that are expected at different ranks in some systems and in some schools, that really goes into a question of something I like to call information overload. And one of the things that's really interesting with most people about information overload is when you, you saturate someone's brain with too much stuff, they shut down. They, they don't tend to discard the new stuff. They don't tend to hone in on the things that work, they just reach a point where they can't handle it anymore. And as instructors, we need to watch out for that. We need to make sure that we're not throwing too much at anyone. 
But I see a lot of instructors, especially new ones, like to overteach. They want their students to know everything. And of course, that's, that's really admirable. They don't want them to um, make the same mistakes that the instructor made as they were coming up through the ranks. And most of them even articulate it that they want their students to be better than them. And I can't say that there's a more admirable goal, admirable goal for an instructor than to want your students to be better than you. I, I've seen it happen and it's, it's awesome. I, I think that, that is probably the best measure of someone's quality as an instructor. But all too often in doing that, the enthusiasm the instructors have, they tend to forget that people learn by making mistakes. And there's a lot of value in making mistakes. Human beings learn through failure. How do you teach a kid how to walk? You don't yell at them when they fall down. You don't pick them up and carry them around and say, oh, you'll never learn how to walk. No, you let the kid stand up and fall down a bunch of times. They learn how to wobble. They stumble around grabbing onto things and ultimately they learn how to walk. And that's an, maybe an easier process for a parent because it's been played out so many times. You know, this kid's going to learn how to walk. You can see it happening. You can see the steps. But I think that looking at a martial arts student's path is really similar. We know that they're going to get through it. You've got to trust that process. As an instructor, you have to trust yourself to say, they're going to get through this. If you're the student, you have to trust that your instructor trusts that you're going to get through this. And you know what? You're not the first person to struggle with whatever it is. It doesn't matter what the art is. It doesn't matter what the movement is. You're not the first person to struggle with that. Everyone else has too. And there's value in making those mistakes because for whatever reason, human beings learn better by screwing things up and correcting them than getting them right. Now, some of the schools out there, like the one that this listener emailed from, have a pretty fixed, sometimes even a rigid martial arts curriculum. And there can be a lot of value in there. It guarantees that people know what's expected of them uh, for their next promotion or what's expected of them as a student in the school. Of course, the more that's written down, the more people are going to understand. It's, it's just communication, right? And it also can help limit the gaps. If someone comes in and they're training and they do really well in certain areas, it can mean reduced time in other areas. And of course, to be a well-rounded martial artist, you've got to hit all the different areas. So having that curriculum, I think, is important, whatever way it is represented in the school. And if it's a smaller school or a school with a single instructor, that curriculum isn't always even written down. And that's not necessarily bad. Again, diversity, different choices, different options. I think they're all good. They all have value. Uh, I think we brought up in the episode on rank and promotion that having a structured curriculum can make promotions more fair. But there's also a tendency to want to include too much, especially if a martial arts instructor has trained in multiple systems or under multiple instructors. They want to bring in all the great stuff that they learned, right? I mean, that's that's how all of the martial arts that we're learning now started. At some point, someone trained under somebody else and they made a twist to it or they trained with two or three people and they brought in the stuff that they liked the best. And there can be a lot, especially if someone's not willing to let go of certain things. Well, this way might work for a larger person, this way might work for a smaller person, and this other way might work if, and this, and that, and this. And so by the time you're done, you have this huge curriculum. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having options, but I think that that core curriculum, the basic expectations of the students as they progress should be fairly small. There's nothing wrong with teaching things on the outside of that. There's nothing wrong with having supplemental things. But I think as the body of knowledge broadens, it can't help but cheapen. That's probably not the right word. It can't help but reduce the 
proficiency, let's go back to that, that each student is going to attain for each of the individual movements. Now, I'm someone that really appreciates diversity in martial arts knowledge. I've trained in half a dozen different schools. Um, I have more than one black belt. Uh, and I like that. I think it's a lot of fun to learn the way different people do things. And I think for me, that's because people are different. People have different bodies. The reasons that people are in martial arts class are different. Uh, the way someone would defend themselves in an actual confrontation is different. And that goes back to my original instructors who, you know, they, they were really key for anyone that thought they might ever become an instructor. Don't just learn it the way that works for you, but ultimately learn it because you might want to pass it on. It might not work, a particular movement, a particular way of doing a movement might not work for you, but there's value in understanding it for your potential students. And I appreciated that. But the things that don't work for me, I didn't spend a ton of time on them, right? And that kind of makes sense. A good core curriculum is going to leave space for individuality. There were things that I spent time on in my early martial arts career that no one else in my then dojo spent time on. I was self-teaching capoeira uh, before YouTube was out there. I had very little to go on, but I was playing with that and I had a lot of fun with that. And my instructors encouraged that. Now, they didn't encourage that at the expense of the core curriculum that we had, but it gave me the opportunity as an individual for some personal development, for some self-expression. Because as the listener said in that email, martial arts is an art, right? We can underscore that word, art. That kind of requires the practitioner to put some of themselves into it. If you're just repeating things physically that you're told to do, that's not so much a martial art, that's a fitness class, right? And for some people, that's what they want, and that's okay. But when we talk about martial arts on this show, we are talking about someone that actually values more than just the physical components of the arts. So let me give you another example. Self-defense. Self-defense is not my favorite aspect of the martial arts, but of course, I do want to learn how to defend myself. I want to be effective at that. And whenever I practice self-defense in a class setting, everything I do boils off to, really, it's four different sets, four different movement patterns that I adapt everything else back to. And it works. And and I like it, and I'm confident in those movements, and I can do them pretty much out of any attack at any time. It's also pretty boring. It's boring for people that are watching, and I've had some instructors who, after seeing me in a testing or seeing me in a class setting, have, I don't want to just say encouraged me, but actually criticized me for not having more movements in my repertoire. And if it's a setting where I'm able to have that discussion, my response is why? How many ways do I need to defend against that? Really, you only need one. You need the one that works, right? And of course, you don't know what one is going to work in the moment that you need it. So you, you want to have options, but I'll relate it back to a Swiss Army knife. I think everyone understands the concept of a Swiss Army knife, pocket knife that you can fold out, different tools. The smaller the knife, the fewer the tools. The fewer tools, the less chance you're going to have what you want in a given situation. But what's the thing that always happens with those big Swiss Army knives? You can never find the tool you're looking for in the moment. It takes forever. You end up flipping them all out. So yeah, diversity is good, but how much is appropriate is a really individual thing. And I think as instructors, and I think with a curriculum, we need to err on the side of having less than having more. Because when you go less, everyone's proficient at those movements. But if you're providing the space for individuality, it gives the opportunity for people to not be bored if they've mastered that. 
and to find their own space for self-expression. And so this really all goes back to the reason that people train. And because you can't have everything in your curriculum, it kind of forces a martial arts school to have an identity. More and more now I'm seeing schools pop up that have a traditional Japanese program, you know, a karate program, and they've got a grappling program like jiu-jitsu or Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and they've got a mixed martial arts program, and they've got a cardio kickboxing program, and they've got uh, this program, and they've got all these things. And what's really the identity of the school? Now, if you've got different training spaces and different instructors doing all of those different things, I think sometimes instructors are afraid of having an identity to say, you know what? This is what we do. We are a traditional Shotokan karate dojo, or we are a WTF taekwondo dojo. Okay, great. Once you've accepted that it's okay to have an identity, you can be better with it, right? You can have less stuff in the curriculum. You can make sure that you teach it great, that you develop the best teaching techniques, and that your students get really good. Now, if it's a self-defense school, there's probably going to be less stuff in the curriculum because what are you really trying to do? You're trying to get people ready for the hopeful, never going to happen case of someone being attacked. You want to drill it into their head. Here are the five things, 10 things, 20 things, whatever it is that, you, that you're going to work on. We're going to drill them into you in different ways, different situations, class after class after class. If it's more of a traditional martial arts class, and I underscore that word art, there's going to be more stuff in there. Find that identity as a school, as a martial arts instructor, and be okay with it. And part of being okay with that is the recognition that what you offer may not be the right fit for some potential students. And that's why there are different martial arts schools and different instructors and different styles because the needs of students are different. And I think some martial arts schools get really nervous about that. I think they want to train everybody. I, I don't think that's the way to look at it. I think as a martial arts instructor, what even the business side of it, the better the people you're turning out, the more retention you're going to have, the more those people are going to be marketing for you and the more they're going to bring like-minded people to your training space, and you're going to have more financial success. If you're trying to offer everything to everyone, it kind of cheapens the value of any one thing, and you're going to attract people that are attracted to cheaper things. The sound, actually. As I'm talking about this piece, I think I could go off on a whole other episode, so I'll stop on that part there and I'll keep rolling. If we think about a curriculum logically, the less stuff you're practicing, the better you're going to get at it if you're putting in the same amount of time, right? If you just practice punching and you punched at a class two hours a week, you'd become a pretty good puncher pretty quickly, but you'd also get pretty bored. And if you get bored, you're probably gonna stop practicing. So ultimately you're not getting very good. You're not getting better. So we're going to need some variety in there. So if we line up all these things we've talked about, I would say at any stage in training, there should only be enough material in the curriculum to keep the student excited. Now that doesn't have to be limited to belt rank. It doesn't have to all be dumped on the student when they earn their new rank. Someone gets a green belt. You don't have to say, hey, you've got two new forms to learn and you've got these three techniques and these five sequences and this defense against a knife and this defense against a choke and this, this, and this. And we're going to cover all that material over the next month. It can be metered out. It could be, hey, you've got to learn this movement. Once you've got that movement down, now we can teach you this new form because this new form incorporates this new movement. Think of it as a spectrum, as a timeline. There, that's the better word. Think of it as a timeline. And the belt ranks are fixed points along there, but there are these smaller divisions, like a ruler or whatever, that you hit that progression as you move across. Now, everybody likes new things, but they really have to know what's expected of them before moving on. Don't just teach someone something new because they're bored. 
If they're bored, that can often reflect back on the instructor and what is being taught and how it's being taught, right? I've had classes where I've taught nothing but, you know, front kick, side kick, back fist, reverse punch for an hour and kept students engaged. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. So you got to think outside the box. And if we want to turn this around, if we want to prep this in a way that we can make the student understand what is expected of them, I've got a great example of a, a school that I'm friendly with. I was spending some time with the instructors recently, and they showed me this sheet that they use for their students. In order to progress to the next belt rank, one of the requirements is that they do each of the forms that is expected of them 50 times. And they've got this sheet where they mark it off. So let's imagine that, you know, this is a, a traditional karate school. So at white belt, they're expected to learn pinyon shodan. And to get their yellow belt, they have to have done pinyon shodan 50 times. And then at the yellow belt, they get another form, another kata. So they're expected to do their new kata 50 times, but they're also expected to do pinyon shodan 50 times. And it keeps going like that up until the point of black belt, where they're doing something like a thousand forms, a thousand katas, just to knock that piece out, just to, for that requirement. I, I think that's really neat. Whether or not you agree with that methodology or you agree with those numbers, the key is that the students know what's expected of them. It's something even a young child at a low rank can understand. And I think that that's really key. Now, what if you're trapped in, in a sense, you're an instructor at a school where you're not the owner, you're not the head instructor. You don't have any say over the material that you're teaching. And it sounds like the listener who wrote in might be in that boat. I would remember that all of advanced techniques and concepts really build off of more basic ones. You know, whether you think of them as Legos or a pyramid or something like that. When you're instructing, you can demonstrate that in the way that you teach. You can break things down and actually quite a bit. And the more age and rank progresses, the more that really becomes necessary, especially if someone has some deficiency, something that they're, they're missing. If you need other ways to break it down, you know, that's where talking to other martial arts instructors, be it in your school or at other schools can really be helpful. I think one of the ways that we lack as a community is sharing teaching techniques. And it's something I would love to see happen more. I know it does happen, but I know a lot of martial arts instructors that play their cards really close to the best. Now, what if you're a student at a school that's like this, that you know really feels like there's a lot for you to have to learn to earn your next rank, you're feeling overwhelmed? In that case, the advice is really the same. You've got to learn how to break things down. And if it's not something you can do yourself, you might have to ask some questions. You might have to ask for some help in breaking those concepts down or those techniques. And it's something you might have to do outside of class. The more that you're expected to know, the more likely you're actually going to be practicing outside of class. The more important, the more necessary that becomes. One of the things I often share with lower ranks is that I genuinely don't know anyone that has earned a black belt and not spent significant time training outside of class. Now, I'm not saying that in order to, to be a legitimate, people like to throw that word around, in order to be a legit black belt, you've got to train 10 hours a week for you know X number of years. I, I hate putting those time frames on some things because when I'm speaking, I'm talking about different schools, different arts, different people. It's a lot easier to do that with a specific style, specific school. So I'm not going to do that. If you do that, that's great. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But becoming a black belt, really mastering anything is going to require some time on your own. And I think that just enhances the value of it. So how does your school do it? Do you have a fixed core curriculum? Is it really well spelled out? Lots of details, maybe a handbook, or maybe it's a list of forms that are learned at certain ranks. Maybe you've got a couple techniques spread in there too. 
do you think there's too much material to learn in your school or maybe there isn't enough expected of the students? However you do it at your school, I really want to hear from you. Let's get some public comments going. Let's get some discussion out there. You can shoot us a message on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. The username is Whistlekick in every case. Or you can leave us a comment on the website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. This is episode 85. Drop us something in the show notes there. Or remember, you can always leave us a comment on YouTube. And for those of you, we don't really mention this on the show very often. We actually have a private Facebook group for the show. So if you go onto Facebook and you search Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, request to be added. Somebody will let you in. And sometimes we have some good conversation going over there too, especially about the show. So I'm expecting some conversation to pop up there. If you want to be a guest on the show, or maybe you have an idea like today's show topic, go ahead, shoot us a message. You can fill out a form on the website. And don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter so you can stay up on everything we're doing. You can learn more about our products at whistlekick.com. And you can even buy some of them now at Amazon. So check that out over there. And that's all for today. But until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. And don't forget the amazing training opportunity we have coming up July 8th, 9th, and 10th, right here in Vermont, the Whistlekick Martial Arts Weekend. It's our debut year for this exciting event. We've got a great collection of instructors coming up, people coming from really all around, all around New England. We've, we've got some people coming from out in the Midwest. It's going to be a ton of fun. I'll be teaching a few sessions and the big huge core thing that we're doing here. Yeah, we're bringing in some amazing instructors, every one of them. Not only will they be instructing, but they will be taking sessions from others. You'll be learning right alongside with them. If you, like me, believe that you get better when you're hanging out, when you're putting yourself in a peer situation with people that are better than you, this is going to be an incredible training opportunity. I'm super pumped for it. Unlike a lot of the things that we do here at Whistlecake, I'm going to be right there in the mix. I will not be on the sidelines during this event. So you can check it out, martialartsweekend.com. No punctuation or anything in there. martialartsweekend.com. Look forward to seeing you there.